Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Catherine Panterbrick, a medical anthropologist trained in human biology and the social sciences. She directs the program on conflict, resilience, and health at the Macmillan Center to engage with academics, practitioners, and policymakers who promote innovations in global health. Together with faculty at Yale, UNICEF, and other global partners, she works with the Early Childhood Peace Consortium to disseminate scientific knowledge on peace building and violence prevention. Professor Panterbrick has directed more than 40 interdisciplinary projects worldwide, has written many scientific articles, and co-edited seven books, including Pathways to Peace. Today, we'll talk with Professor Panterbrick about her new book, Medical Humanitarianism, Ethnographies of Practice. Welcome, Professor Panterbrick. Thank you for having me. Certainly. Let's begin with your book. Please give us an overview of it. So the book, Medical Humanitarianism, is, uh, presents 12 case studies mm -hmm. of humanitarian life. And it's framed with an introduction and a conclusion that shows the purpose and the scope of the book. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the book is to give uh, concrete insights into the practice of medical humanitarianism. And it's directed to two audiences, mm -hmm. social scientists and humanitarian practitioners. And I think the readers of the book would be those who are curious about the intersection of medicine, human right advocacy, international development, mm -hmm. peace building, and humanitarianism. And also be um, readers who are interested in the power of ethnography, which is the systematic study of people and culture, in this case of humanitarian life, as told through a story. Okay. So the main point of the book is two, 12 very powerful stories mm -hmm. about humanitarian life. Okay. All right, we'll get to those 12 stories in a minute, but I think some of us don't know what the, the term medical humanitarianism means, so tell us a little bit about what that term means. The term is defined as the Biomedical Global Health Epidemiological Initiatives mm -hmm. um, undertaken to save lives or alleviate suffering in crises mm -hmm. born of conflict, disaster, or neglect. So there's three pieces to that definition. Okay. It's about health, it's about intervention, and it's about crises. Mm -hmm. And that's the gist of it. Okay. Um, why we focus on medical humanitarianism in particular is interesting. The uh, humanitarianism is about the practice of care for people who are in great danger or distress. Mm -hmm. And medicine is about clinical practice and knowledge regarding health with humanitarian aspirations. So the two terms talk to each other. Okay. And it's true to say that humanitarianism has become increasingly professionalized and increasingly medicalized. Mm -hmm. So that why, that's why it exists as a subfield. OK. Um, May I say also that of uh, course. medical humanitarianism is really a field of practice. It's about the people who practice humanitarian aid, mm -hmm. um, the, who deliver the aid, and also the policymakers that organize the local and international mm -hmm. uh, delivery of aid. And it's also about a space of academic inquiry about the cultures and the systems that voiced this um, humanitarian action. So a lot of books and uh, articles have already been written with a fairly critical eye about the moral and the ethical dilemmas and the challenges and the unintended consequences mm -hmm. of humanitarian action. So it's both a field of practice and a field of a academic inquiry. Okay. Very good. So how did the book come about? So I wanted a book that would be great, a great book for teaching mm -hmm. uh, in anthropology in the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. Okay. I wanted a book that would speak to the practice on the ground, had real experience. I wanted a book that wasn't sensational journalism, nor uh, heavy jargon theory. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted a book that would uh, expand the intellectual inquiry, but be very compassionate to the people who are taking very difficult decisions in very fraught environments, because it's very easy to be critical and alienate humanitarian workers in difficult situations. But you also have to be um, you know, c compassionate to, to the situation on the ground. And I found, or my co-editor found me, Sharon Abranovich, who wanted also to redefine the field together. We had a workshop in the University of Florida, where she is, and the University at Yale. We invited people who had stories to tell, who could write short, memorable, jargon-free stories mm -hmm. that would 
speak about, that would invite social critique, but also would, would capture the moment, the fraught moment of the okay. humanitarian challenge. And we then decided to frame the book in this comparative way of presenting the 12 stories side by side to juxtapose them mm -hmm. so that the reader would uh, be taken in by the depth of the case study mm -hmm. but also see the breadth of the themes that would arrive. Okay. So in my metaphor it's like having the reader um, go through the wood and seeing as much as the forest as it does as he or she does from an individual tree mm -hmm. to really understand the case study but understand the bigger themes that arise. Okay. And would you say that these 12 stories are best case practices um, exemplified, or do you also show some things that uh, maybe they could have done something a little bit better? No, I think there, there's no best uh, approach. It, they they okay. really show conflict, okay. uh, real big dilemmas, mm -hmm. uh, tough situations, and um, either because of a humanitarian worker working in a particular situation or the very difficult decisions that you can make, for instance, withdrawing from a country in conflict. Mm -hmm. So they, they're all about a particular story of a particular people in a moment of great difficulties, and oh. they illuminate that situation. Okay, let's get to the meat of it. T pick one of the stories um, and tell us about it. Um, you know, I, I'm also interested in learning about the contributors and, of course, the lessons learned. So if you can pick one of the stories and and go through it and then and tell us what the well, lesson was. Maybe when was. Uh, we talk about lessons learned, I'll talk about some others. Okay. But so I open up with chapter one okay. um, that I wrote with a consultant who works for uh, a local government and mm -hmm. an NGO on the Afghan-Pakistan border areas. Okay. Um, and it opens up with this, um, this head of the a non-governmental organization that talks about the killing that has just happened mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the road uh, on those border areas where a van that was transporting NGO workers was overtaken by a motorcycle. The two riders pulled out a five-year-old child and sprayed with the van with bullet, killing one man and six women. Mm -hmm. And they were, all uh, they were all employed by the local government to, to uh, distribute humanitarian aid. So it continues with some of the testimonies not, uh, not around this particular taste, but several testimonies of people working in humanitarian uh, settings in those fraught borders, mm -hmm. caught in the forks of conflict. And it really shows the moral experience that happens for these local workers and how they are kind of facing every day the threat of kidnapping, the threat of killings, mm -hmm. uh, the threat of social ostracism, very difficult situation, and w how they articulate their calling. Mm -hmm. And it makes for a uh, a, ch a chapter that focuses on human dignity and compassion mm -hmm. rather than a f chapter that focuses only on, of, on suffering and fear. Okay. And then it continues on to understand what the organization themselves can provide for these workers. Mm -hmm. And we're familiar with these symptoms of burnout where mm -hmm. you get uh, basically burnt out by this humanitarian activity. And what people do uh, to alleviate fear, to alleviate mm -hmm. distress, and to find some kind of calmness in their lives. So that's the example of a moment mm -hmm. that's both in the news. We've had um, in the news recently two bombings of MSF clinics. Mm -hmm. So it illustrates the danger of life. And the, and the chapter is called Dignity Under Extreme Duress. Mm -hmm. So it's an extreme duress, extreme danger situation, yeah. but it shows a spirit of human dignity in articulating why you would want to continue with that work. Right, very good. Um, what about another of the contributors? Tell us about another I could chapter. tell you um, of many different ones. I'll probably give you two vignettes, one of um, them. I'm sorry to interrupt. So b these are from countries all over the world, yes? Yes, there are um, many in Africa, okay. uh, in Asia, Caribbean, mm -hmm. and um, I forgot. The Middle East? Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> of course. Yes. Okay. And the so Middle East one is Israel. Okay. So yeah. give us another example. Well, another example from Israel would be the balancing act that humanitarian workers have to do when they disperse medical aid to Israeli citizens, mm -hmm. but also find themselves wanting to disperse medical aid to illegal migrants. Mm -hmm. So you have constantly to navigate a system whereby some are more deserving than others. So it shows the ethical and moral dilemmas of that. Another uh, interesting chapter is about the doctors 
working for the British Army in Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, who are doctors who therefore process, profess to save lives, but will also take a life in allegiance to the military. Um, so it, it's about these contested ideals that you carry mm -hmm. as a humanitarian worker in a specific situation. Right, okay. The trade-offs that you make. Right, right. Um, so it must be very difficult for people who work out in the field. Do you talk at all in the book about what um, a worker can do to um, try and stay positive about what they're doing? Yeah, we have a whole section on that moral experience mm -hmm. and understanding that in a deep way. Mm -hmm. um, we have other books that are, the other chapters, so other stories that are much more critical, mm -hmm. very critical. For instance, one by Tim Allen on the refugee camps in Uganda mm -hmm. that shows that humanitarian workers are really working within bubbles, bubbles of knowledge. They, they have camps themselves, they don't they only interact during the day. They don't see what's going on during the night. They have their own idea of what is going on and what the reality is and what diseases are afflicting people. And so there's this dissonance between what's really happening on the ground and the humanitarian knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's a deconstruction of knowledge. And that chapter is particularly critical, for instance. And so I would imagine when you're teaching about this, this is something you can highlight and say, here's, you know, suggest ways to get around that or improve upon it. I mean, how would you teach to that particular example? So the point of the book, I think, is to let the story speak for itself. Okay. So in the example I gave you about the Afghan-Pakistan mm -hmm. border, I think I tried to make the story as compassionate as possible. Mm -hmm. um, in the story I gave you about the Ugandan refugee camps, the story is as critical as possible. I try to steer middle ground between being critical and compassionate. Um, I want an insight about the humanitarian field that is both I don't want to invite so much critique as to be invite paralysis about having no action happen mm -hmm. or the eye of humanitarian workers. I don't want to be such a, you know, uh, have such an impulse of heroism and humanitarian action that I have no critical reflection about what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. it's a balancing act. Um, but we don't um, say much except mm -hmm. in the introduction and conclusion. We let the stories speak for themselves and the idea is that you will just come out with this idea, yes, of course it's difficult, but that's not news. Mm -hmm. But they are specific areas to focus on in which you can be much more, uh, have much more robust understanding of the situation on the ground. Right, right, okay. So in terms of um, conclusions, um, you know, what, what do you offer? So uh, the lessons or the conclusions? Oh, well, well, let's do lessons, I'm okay. sorry. So the lessons, um, I think, uh, I take away the lessons as understanding there's four things that I would want to teach about, about medical humanitarianism. Uh, one of them is about the grounding of that experience, what it's like mm -hmm. on, in the minute of humanitarian action and what it means and how complex it can be um, and how human the stories are. Um, another one is about uh, this knowledge, this idea of knowledge that we construct. So we are, for instance, in a situation of crisis, let's say, um, one of the chapters of the book talks about Niger and the food crisis. Now, do you define this as a medical crisis like MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without mm -hmm. Borders is doing, which means a medical and judicial intervention? Or you define that as a livelihood crisis, in which case you need food security and international development. So the way you call that crisis is contested, mm -hmm. and that means the solutions that follow are very dependent on that that knowledge. Right. Um, another, uh, Alex Deval, for instance, sh asks us to understand patterns of violence, lethal violence, whether they're genocide or civil war or ethnic strife. The word you give to that crisis, the emerg whether you t t say it's an emergency or not, defines the solution. So the, mm -hmm. the body of knowledge is actually uh, very contested. And a lot of it is about the power of the person who speaks. Mm -hmm. So local voices are ignored expert voices are called for. One of the lessons that I've learned is that we've often focused on the uh, suffering of the beneficiaries and the safety of international expatriate workers, but we've sidelined these national humanitarian workers that work all their lives in one place. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned that that knowledge is very contested. Uh, I've learned more about the ethical challenges that happen. One chapter in the book is about a small NGO in Sierra Leone that accepts 
uh, students from Western institutions that come for short-term humanitarian missions mm -hmm. and all the problematic, flexible, ethical uh, events that happen in that wake with a lot of movement and transient movement. Sure. Um, so everybody gets to be a humanitarian in that sense. So mm -hmm. it's a very um, fluid and very uh, contested kind of field. Mm -hmm. That's why it makes you think. And the picture of the book is about, um, shows both the emotion of suffering and the critical thinking that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So I like the subtitle, Ethnographies of Practice. It's about practice, but it's about through the telling of a story that you understand those lessons as they speak to you. Right. So it's the stories, or the lessons I go is that you can go from the very deeply personal story to a very political story and back again. And that tells you about the human and the social side of humanitarian life. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's extremely complicated. It's complicated, um, but that doesn't involve uh, that doesn't invite paralysis right, either. Right. Uh, the very wonderful thing happening is that dial or that conversation happening between academics and practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some examples of this at Yale. Um, so uh, you know, humanitarians aren't uh, paralyzed by complication; mm -hmm. they have a mandate. It's how you define your mandate that right, allows right. you to act. But I think it's important that they understand that there, it is kind of complicated in how you approach. So I think those, the humanitarian actors are the ones who understand the best about mm -hmm. the complexity of their right. case. But in the end, it, it is a humanitarian purpose. In the end, it's an act of caregiving. It's sure. an act of, not an act of saving lives, mm -hmm. but an act of caring for humanity. So that's medical practice in mm -hmm. essence. But um, everybody... Um, ev everybody involved in the field knows it's complicated. The main thing is to learn about lessons learned, of mm -hmm. course. Um, as I said before, the, the field is incre increasingly professionalized. Right. So we teach about this, mm -hmm. we train people about this. We're trained in the field through long-term experience. You, you learn on, on the job, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, then you come out with sometimes huge respect for the people who are uh, living in danger, doing an imperfect job, but being there where it counts. Right. So I come out with the other side, not throwing my hands in the air, but with immense respect, really, with um, what is happening on the ground for many of the stories. There are some, obviously, which are not so noble, mm -hmm. <laughs> and others which are very much so. Right, right. And conclusions. So in conclusions, well, as speaking as an anthropologist, I would say that what I've taken out is that I need more fluency in the languages of humanitarian life. Mm -hmm. And by that, I don't mean learning, speak, learning English and French mm -hmm. or any other languages. I mean the technical language of the delivery of care, the administrative language of organizing international assistance, the financial language of the flows of money that govern action, um, the medical uh, language about the interventions that happen. So mm -hmm. I become much more um, multidimensional in my understanding of humanitarian practice, and I think that moves the field forward. So you, you build, like Russian dolls, you mm -hmm. build a financial, administrative, medical, and technical aspect mm -hmm. of humanitarian assistance. And I think also you learn to be very respectful of the practical concerns of humanitarian assistance, which is delivering aid where it needs to be done, or delivering assistance where it needs to be mm -hmm. done, and very uh, also casting um, the practice of humanitarian assistance with with some critical, some, giving offering some critical insights about it. So mm -hmm. the two really go together. It's a dance of, as I say, you know, un understanding insights that give you a critical and compassionate understanding of the practice of humanitarian assistance. Very good. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your work. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. For more information about Professor Panterbrick and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.